Welcome to the Open Forum in the Villages Florida podcast. In this show we talk to leaders in the community, leaders of clubs and interesting folks who live here in the villages, to give perspectives of what is happening here in the Villages Florida. We hope to add a new episode most Fridays at 9 a.m. Our host Mike Roth has been a Villages resident since 2017. He is the leader of three lifestyle clubs and created a fourth. Mike joined 20 clubs in the first year he was here in the Villages. Mike is a strong leader. Before coming to the Villages, Mike was a successful business leader and had a successful podcast in Cincinnati called Cincinnati Business Talk. That shows 300 episodes are still available and has over 90,000 listens. Mike is an instructor at the Villages Enrichment Academy, teaching podcasting 101 for beginners. This podcast is a listener-supported podcast. You can become a supporter for as little as $3 per month or you can choose to pay more. To become a supporter go to openforuminthevillagesflorida.com and click on support in the black box. There will be shoutouts for supporters in episodes. As a supporter, you will get a direct email link to Mike. In our new season 5, we are making significant improvements and changes on an ongoing basis. First is our new and better logo, upgrades in recording equipment to allow easy access for remote guests. Second is a continuing increase in the use of AI in the creation of each episode. These include, a transcript of each show. Please understand that there may be errors inserted by the AI that may not be caught before the transcript is published, however, this is a dramatic step forward. In fact, all the show's announcers are now all AI voices, including me, Emily. Open Forum in the Villages, Florida has been publishing new episodes on YouTube for the last several months. If you have a book that you would like to turn into an audiobook, let us know via email to mike at rothvoice.com. Hope you enjoy today's show. This is Mike Roth on Open Forum in the Villages. Welcome to season number five. I'm here today with Dr. William Shang. My interest... But you're thin, <laughs> or at least your your prob your metabolics the the be what do they call that the basal metabolic rate basal metabolic rate is probably well within the normal range. Do you know what the major determinant of basal metabolic rate is? Uh, weight and height. No, it's lean body mass. It's how much muscle you have on your body. Mm-hmm. If you have a, a lot of skeletal muscle on your body, you will have a high metabolic rate. So if you do strength training mm-hmm. and you increase muscle, Mm -hmm. then you will increase your basal metabolic rate and you will be burning calories throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, I think most people have the misconception that weightlifters, people who do that, they're the gym rat, Mm -hmm. but we're only talking about two hours a week. Two hours a week in the gym? Yeah. So one, you know, one session for an hour, then followed by another session in an hour. And what you're doing is creating these very small microscopic tears in the muscle. Mm Mm-hmm. At a very gradual rate. And then the next uh, day, your body's repairing it. And then the day after that, it's still repairing it. And that takes a lot of energy. So that's why we feel strains when we go to the gym. That's right. It's Then you wind up taking Tylenol. (laughs) Well, that you probably overdid it then. Uh, If you do it right, it's a little bit achy the next day. But um, you don't want to do what I did initially. What Uh, did you do initially? I followed followed Arnold's prescription there. Oh, and what happened to you? Well, I hurt my shoulder. Okay. And, you know, I was out for months. And mm. there is, so there was a study that was done, uh, and this is more than two decades ago now. Mm-hmm. The U.S. government funded this uh, National Diabetes Prevention Program, and they studied the best way for people to exercise, to beat diabetes and beat metabolism. And uh, what's interesting is that even though the study beat all Medic- medication. Mm-hmm. We don't know that much about the exercises that were done. You have to actually read the study and you've got to look at the supplement that came with the study and you can see how they exercised. What kind of exercises did they use? They did not use any fancy gym equipment. Okay. It was all what they call those selector type, you know, the, the one with the little key that you s- stick into this, uh, those metal plates. Yes. And uh, they had X number of times you do it, and uh, you gradually progress. And I was so intrigued by that that it was not in the public domain easily. Mm-hmm. That I I took their their studies and I wrote a book on it okay. because it's so important that the public knows that it's in their hands. They can do this. They don't. And, and what is the name of the book, Doctor? Oh, Jay? it's called the first program: fighting insulin resistance with strength training. Mm-hmm. It's available mm-hmm. on Amazon. But in there. I show you what the government discovered. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing to me is that 
we don't spread the knowledge like the governments in New Zealand or Australia because of the way the incentives are built in this country to health care. Sent to the drug companies. Well, I don't want to blame them. It's just the way the incentives are set up. So how long ago did you write your book? Um, it, I think it's uh, seven Seven years Seven ago. years now, yeah. Okay, in the past seven years, how many copies were sold approximately? I think three or 4,000, something three like that. Three or 4,000. Mm -hmm. Is it available as an audio book? No, I think I would have to sit down and read it, but I don't even like to hear myself. Okay, don't worry. I have AI voices that can read it for you. Uh, but only seven, is that 7,000? No, no. Uh, what did I say, three or 4,000? Three or 4,000. How many people do you think should read oh. in America? In England. Well, I, I, would, I wouldn't say necessarily have to read. I would say if you take this knowledge, mm -hmm. it's well close to two-thirds of our adult population who have... So at least 50 million people. Easily. Mm -hmm. Easily. And what's, what's really the take-home message here is that medications, they don't treat necessarily the root problem here. Mm -hmm. They give you systematic relief. Perhaps. Maybe. 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 You know, statins, for example, they work on an enzyme that's in the muscle. So... Mm -hmm. That's why many people who take statins have muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. But my question is, why would you want to do that when you can do the same thing without a medication, without the side effects? And how much exercise per week would someone need to do beyond just walking for a half hour a day to uh, drop the statins? Mm. Well, uh, it's individual your, just or your a, own. Okay, guess. You know. Okay. So I would say that you can only do the best you can do. And well, we all, as we age, we all have other problems, whether it's hips, knees, shoulders, back. Mm -hmm. We have these parts of our body that are wearing out or become arthritic. And that makes people resistive to exercise because the exercise is going to make that part of their body hurt. Okay, I can answer that question. Good. There are undoubtedly areas that, and everybody who it hurts to move. Mm -hmm. What's great about metabolic exercise? or the exercise of moving those large muscles, is that you can pick and choose. you got a shoulder that hurts. Don't do lat pull down. Don't do overhead presses. You don't have to. You can do those portions that, that help and mm -hmm. that don't hurt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this becomes selective and individualistic. Each person needs to pick the exercises that they do. And I think you said you need two hours a week of these types of exercises. Right, two sessions a week. Two sessions a week. That's right. Of an hour each. I mean, that's about how long it takes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, not everyone who starts off is going to be able to do an hour, but... Right, right. And there are people who are already too far gone and can't move very much. Obviously, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the next best time is today. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, that makes sense. And then you have to water it, fertilize it to make sure the thing grows. That's true. Put, put it in a place where it's actually going to get some sunlight. Okay, let me uh, ask you about something else we talked about before, and we wanted to put this in the show. This is the area about sugar and how people become addicted to the taste of sugar, mm. whether it's in cookies or cake or ice cream. You, 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 you have a solution for it, a strange one, but <laughs> why don't you share with our audience what that solution is? Uh, prior to the commercialization of sugar, which was about the time of the Industrial Revolution, the average person's sugar intake came from honey, Okay, yes. maybe maple syrup. Yes, good stuff. But that was it. There are aren't too many other natural sources of sugar. Mm. And in the 1700s, the average person in England had one teaspoon of sugar a day. That much, okay. That much. Uh, about 10 years ago, we peaked in the U.S. Mm -hmm. at about a little over a cup a day of sugar. Mm. And um, it's hidden in a lot of different things. It's massive. And it, sugar meets the criteria for an addictive substance. No kidding. What are the criteria? Well, let's think about it. If you don't have sugar... Does it change your mood? Mm -hmm. If you don't have sugar, do you crave it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you... See, let me think of some other... What happens when you stop eating sugar? Oh, yeah. When you stop eating sugar, then you crash. Mm -hmm. So one of the, uh, the problems is... And it was actually created uh, by the U.S. government when they decided to make the recommendation to decrease cholesterol on our foods, mm -hmm. is that we had to put something else in there. To make food palatable, and that was sugar. Oh. And so it was very quietly a few years ago the U.S. government says cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern. Uh, but so sugar. Oh, yeah. So I brought something today. Okay. Why don't you tell our audience what you brought? Go get it. comes in a little okay. pill bottle from like a drugstore or Amazon. So this is from just a, uh, it happens to be Swanson Vitamins, but I'm not advertising for them. It's called Gynostema. Silvestri. Say that, or maybe spell it for our listeners. So the first word is, begins like the word gym, gymnasium, 
G-Y-M-N, and then it ends E-M-A. And then the last word is Sylvester, like ruin that cat on the cartoon. Or Sy- Sylvester, Sylvester the Stallone. Cat. Oh, Sylvester Stallone, right? Except it's T-R-E instead of E-R. This is an Indian substance, the Asian Indian Asian substance. Asian Indian substance. That they use in herbal medicine to treat uh, high blood sugar. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's remarkable. You know, I think uh, one thing that I was, when I researched these nutraceuticals, these uh, plant-based medicine, mm-hmm. treat prediabetes, is that there was a lot of research out there, but it's not in your typical journal that I used to read like JAMA or the New England Journal. They are published in other type of journals that don't overlap. So I brought this today and I thought we can try this and you can see for yourself. Okay, so what, what, what you've done is you've taken one of the capsules apart and put it into a piece of paper, a small amount, probably a couple of grams, is it, would you say? Oh, it's less than that. It's, it's less than that. It's um, uh, just, uh, so this is the ground up dried leaf. And so, it's ground up. so we're going to put this on our tongue. Okay, so we're going to take this brown powder, and put it on our tongue. So we may sound a little different. All right, so we're just going to move it around and coat the top of the tongue. Mm-hmm. To me, it tastes like mocha. I don't know. What do you think? It's got a different kind of taste. It's not really mocha. It, okay. So I brought some sweet tarts, some candy there with different colors. So you can pick one that's something mm, that I you got can... a gray one. Okay. It says you... chip. It must be chocolate. Okay. So I have the same color as you. Okay. Okay. So I think it's great. Great. We put it in our mouth. And you've been chewing it. And what do you taste, Mike? These sweet tarts are pretty sweet. Mm. <clears throat> well, I'll confess I've never had a sweet tart by itself. Okay. If I taste anything, maybe a, a, a slight hint of grape. Slight hint of grape. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, these are, okay, these are very sweet. How much sugar was in them? Oh, okay. There's a gram of sugar in each one. There, this, this, this is kid's candy, okay? Mm-hmm. You, this should be knock your socks off sweet. Okay. So, it's not knock my socks off sweet. When I crushed it with my teeth, that's when I really began to taste the grape-type flavor in it. Mm. But it didn't taste sweet. It just tasted grapey. Okay. So it only lasts for about 30 minutes. So it, don't worry, your taste buds will come back. Okay, my strawberry shortcake for dessert at dinner will be okay. <laughs> you won't, you won't uh, be able to blame me for it tasting bad. Uh, this is an interesting substance because it helps in two ways. They sell this in a liquid form too that you can spray in your mouth. For mm-hmm. people who don't have the willpower to resist sweets during the holidays mm-hmm. or any time, there you go. Uh, but it also, it works because it blocks the sugar receptors on the I mean, tongue. It's funny you mentioned that. We had a Mercedes-Benz holiday party mm. uh, last Tuesday night, and there were 68 people at the party. And we, we had, you know, a catered affair, you know, some fish, some uh, veggies, some uh, rollatini, eggplant, uh, a little bit of steak. And the only thing that we ran out of was cookies. <laughs> Okay, since my wife and I actually purchased the cookies, we knew there were over 100 cookies <laughs> with only 68 people. Mm. They were going like that, mm-hmm. and there were leftovers of everything else. <laughs> so this is, it works by blocking the sugar receptors on your tongue, mm-hmm. and hopefully I can, you know, you've experienced this now. Yes. We also have um, sweet, recept- I, I, sweet receptors in the pancreas, and we have sweet receptors in our brain. That's what makes us crave sweet stuff. Mm -hmm. And the way that the Indian doctors used it is they would ingest, you you can take the, I open the capsule, but you can just swallow them. Yeah. And they, it goes into the pancreas, into the brain, and it blocks the desire to, uh, to eat sugar. Oh, no more desserts. Well, it's not as intense a craving. Well, yeah. I mean, that, that worked for me when I, as, as a diet, uh, many years ago when I was noticed I was gaining a little bit of weight. Mm. And eating out a lot for business, uh, I figured it was easier to drink a second cup of coffee, okay, and not have dessert. Mm. And that worked for many years. Not so much anymore. Mm. I don't like coffee as much anymore. What I find very interesting is that there's a whole bunch of plant-based medicine out there mm-hmm. that is relatively unfamiliar to the to the public in general. That that helps with various aspects of weight gain, lipid management, and and high blood sugar. So from a a medical perspective, there are a few doctors in the villages, sometimes chiropractors, that uh, are professing that their methodology will create weight loss, and they're probably using these natural vegetables or extracts to uh, to get there as opposed to a uh, prescription drug. It could be. I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with any particular person you're talking about. Certainly, 
the medical profession because our medical license allows us to do surgery and write prescription drugs. This is not our bailiwick per se. Mm-hmm. The um, I think what's interesting about this is that the average person can avail themselves of something that actually works. And these are, as I mentioned earlier, these are studies that have been done. It's just not readily available. One of the benefits that I have with an academic affiliation is I can pull these studies up. They're not behind a paywall and okay. see that there is actually a scientific basis for for uh, suggesting these. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I wrote this up in my second book, which is... Well, I, you have two books. I have two books, right. We hope... What's the name of the second book? Well, the, the second book, it has this title called The Thin Prediabetic, which I wish... I, I probably should uh, rewrite the contents in because I was r- thinking about somebody who has a high blood glucose level and they go to their doctor and they have, the doctor would say, well, I can put you on metformin or you can lose weight. Oh, you don't need to lose weight. Then what do, can they do? But most of the book actually has to do with these plants mm-hmm. that and other supplements that, that might work. Mm-hmm. And that book also on Amazon? Yes, also on Amazon. This is Mike Roth with Dr. Craig Curtis with today's Alzheimer's tip. What is the diagnostic process to split the difference between someone who has Alzheimer's and someone who has a different form of dementia? That's a great question, Mike. So Alzheimer's disease in the past was a clinical diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And we would talk to the patient and the family And they would tell us about this progressive memory loss and maybe other symptoms that had been occurring occurring over the past three to five years. Mm -hmm. And we would simply test their memory and maybe wait another year or two and retest their memory to look for decline. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's completely different. As a matter of fact, now our diagnostic process involves actually looking for amyloid in the brain, which we now know causes Alzheimer's disease. How do you see amyloid in the brain? We can see amyloid in the brain using PET scans, which is the most common way. And now we're working on using blood tests, which are going to be coming out in the next few years. In fact, there's already one blood test that is FDA cleared to detect amyloid in the blood, which is reflecting amyloid in the brain. And that would be the differential between another type of dementia and Alzheimer's. Yes, sir. Dr. Curtis's goal is to educate the village's community on how to live a longer, healthier life. To learn more, visit his website, craigcurtismd.com or call 352-500-5252 to attend a free seminar. Remember, our next episode will be released next Friday at 9 a.m. Should you want to become a major supporter of the show or have questions, please contact us at mike at rothvoice.com. This is a shout out for supporters. Greg Pangian, Tweet Coleman, Dan Capellan, Ed Williams, Alvin Stenzel, and major supporter Dr. Craig Curtis at K2 in the Villages. We will be hearing more from Dr. Curtis with short Alzheimer's tips each week. If you know someone who should be on the show, contact us at mike at rothvoice.com. We thank everyone for listening to the show. The content of the show is copyrighted by Rothvoice 2023. All rights reserved.